Hello, and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. This week, we're discussing the assault by Hamas on Israel and the implications, what happens immediately, what happens for the region, what happens for the long-running conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. We're recording a few days on from the Hamas attacks, which seem to take the world and the Israeli security forces by surprise. The ferocity of the attacks and the number of Israeli civilians killed and taken hostage has shocked the country and those beyond, despite it coming after months of rising tensions. Now the Gaza Strip is under what Israel calls a total siege, with food, water and power held back from its more than two million inhabitants. Israeli airstrikes are pounding the Strip. In less than a week, more than a thousand lives have been lost on each side. So we'll be talking about what prompted Hamas to launch its attack, the Israeli response, the dilemmas over that, and the impact on the people of Gaza and the region. Joining me in this studio, I have Professor Yossi Meckelberg, an associate fellow with our Middle East and North Africa program. Welcome, Yossi. Hello. Hello, good to have you here. Joining us down the line as well is Dr. Elham Fakro. She is an associate fellow also with our Men Up program and author of a book on the Abraham Accords. Welcome, Elham. Thank you. And finally joining us as well is Reuters journalist Steve Farrell, former Times and Reuters bureau chief in Jerusalem, who has covered the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for over a decade and co-authored a book on Hamas. Welcome, Steve. Welcome. Steve, I want to start with you with the not trivial question of what is Hamas and why have they done this? Hamas is an Islamist militant Palestinian group, uh, offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, was founded in 1987 in the the opening days of the first Palestinian Intifada or uprising. Um, And it is is the chief domestic rival to the more secular uh, PLO, Mahmoud Abbas, President Mahmoud Abbas's Palestine Liberation Organization. And very simply, um, it has, I think it has done this in order to assert its continuing, as it deems it right to Palestinian people's right of resistance um, to fight Israel's military occupation. But it's also done it to marginalize um, Abbas, to marginalize its more secular opponents, and I think to drive any chance of a Saudi uh, and other Middle East countries doing peace deals with Israel off the table. And just on that last point, there's been a lot of speculation about whether that really was one of the motives, one of the reasons for this happening now. Do you put a lot of weight on that? You, you can't know for sure, but look at history. The last time the Saudis uh, proposed a peace plan um, in March 2002, um, it was due to be discussed at the Arab League in Beirut. All the journalists in the Middle East were there. And in the middle of the Arab League meeting, Hamas blew up a hotel in Israel on Passover, killing a whole lot of uh, Holocaust survivors um, because they and they sent a message saying we are the power within Palestine, the message to the Arab nations trying to uh, meddle here. So they've done this before. And again, it's at a time when the Saudis uh, appeared to be inching towards some sort of rapprochement with Israel, um, which uh, the, the Palestinians would see themselves as being further and further marginalized. Elham, do you agree with that? You've been writing extensively, including in your book, on Israel's normalization uh, with Arab countries. Um, do you think that the chances of the Saudi deal were significant, that, that really we were looking at what might have been a big change in Israel's relations with its neighbors? Yeah, I, I do agree partly. I think there's the other aspect of this, which is Hamas being a resistance movement. Um, the leader of the military wing of Hamas did actually deliver a message after the attack, describing them as retaliation for Israel's occupation of Palestinian land. Um, and so that's, that's the reason cited by them specifically. And I think it's, it's important to look at the context here in which these events take place, which is the context of occupation, uh, the longest in modern history. Um, since Hamas came to power in the Gaza Strip in 2006, the territory has been under a land, sea, and air blockade by Israel. It's now in its 17th year. Um, we're talking about a blockade on the entry of goods and the movement of two million people today who can't exit or leave the territory. So the 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 the, very, the violence that you've seen is is a response to that. It's a it's a response as well uh, to to the blockade and to the occupation more generally. You'll see. How is the debate in Israel 
taking these particular questions of, of why this attack happened at this time? It depends who you ask. Because those who always thought Hamas is not a partner for any future peace between Israel and Palestine, so they said it is just really exonerated. There are others who will say there was not enough room for change because of the blockade and the harsh blockade that uh, created this space for extremism and radicalization. So I don't think it will change in the long run where people actually started this debate. What it will, what it might change, or I hope it's going to change, the understanding that the security paradigm collapsed and the idea that the only way to ensure security of Israeli citizens is by having uh, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated fences and having uh, more troops on the ground and not having peace negotiations or having any engagement uh, that improves the, the, the relations with, uh, with, uh, with the Palestinians. And here comes also the issue of the, the normalization. If it would stop the normalization, it's also another sign that it's impossible, it's not going to happen that Israel could be able to normalize relations with its neighbor unless it resolves the, the Palestinian issue and go exactly back to 2002 that Sir mentioned and the Saudi peace initiative that was followed by, by the Beirut declaration. Now, I can suggest actually an alternative scenario to that. Maybe this is the point that Saudis will say, it's in our interest to normalize relations with, uh, with, with Israel because it's also improved relations with the United States. It will enab uh, enable us to, to sign a, a strategic uh, alliance. We can maybe even develop nuclear capability, civilian one. So if that's the way that the Palestinians conduct their affairs, we'll park the Palestinian issue and look after our own interests. Now, I find it plausible that that was part of the Saudi calculation, though I suspect not something you're now going to hear from the Saudi government after uh, these, the, these attacks. But at the same time, uh, what you do hear from those close to those talks is, while there was an awful lot in the U.S. press and the Israeli press about how this deal was perhaps imminent, um, from the Saudi perspective, they were asking a lot of the U.S., as you said, asking um, a commitment to a civil nuclear program and also asking at least for some concessions to the Palestinians, uh, maybe not uh, anything like what the Palestinian leadership wanted, but asking for some concessions that the Netanyahu government really could not have uh, have made and survived. So do you think this, this, this deal was really live? Mm. But it, there are three parties to this, because it's not just Israel and, and as you mentioned, and, and Saudi Arabia. For Netanyahu, he's desperate. He was desperate before, he's even more desperate now. Because it has to do with the corruption trial, maintaining his, his time power. Biden needs it. It's important for him because it's, we are approaching election, election year, and he's standing in, in, the, in the polls in, is not great. Actually, the Saudis are the ones that hold the cards because they can play the long game. Nothing, any of this issue, normalization of, or nuclear or strategic alliance, is not a pressing issue because of the way p politics is conducted in Saudi Arabia. And as MBS himself, the Crown Prince, said in, in, in the Fox interview, we are edging closer, we are one step closer every day. He just didn't mention how long is the journey, as long as what the pace of this. So he can text and, yeah, if I'll see progress on the other fronts, then we can also normalize relations. Steve, Yossi mentioned at the beginning of what he was just saying, a view, maybe a hope, that this will have made the point to many in Israel that security alone cannot keep the people safe. Do you think that that change of view is likely in Israel? I mean, I wouldn't speak for the Israelis, but right now um, I would imagine that the feelings of fury and anger um, are uppermost in people's minds. And certainly, as far as Netanyahu is concerned, um, the primary thing that Hamas did in this, um, this attack, which you know, shockwaves have gone around the world on it um, more than anything they've ever done before, uh, it makes Netanyahu look incredibly weak. Um, and it's, it's not a region that forgives weakness. Um, I think Hamas knew Netanyahu was weak. I think Hamas know that Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is weak. I think absolutely they factored in 
or everything that's been going on at uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and the West Bank and settlers and uh, well, right-wing Israeli government. And I think they, they waited a long time. They picked their moment and they committed such an, such a, an atrocity that I really doubt Israelis are going to be moving towards thinking about reconcilement and rapprochement in the longer term anytime soon. I think many would agree with you on that point. Can you take us then into the calculations that Israel faces now about its response to this? Well, Netanyahu certainly has to go in hard into Gaza and will go in hard. Whether that erases the memory of the day one, I mean, the the the, the party goers being attacked and, and elderly women being taken away in golf buggies and bodies on the streets, whatever he does now, it is not going to erase the memory of that. But he is clearly going to go in hard. Um, there's all sorts of talk about wiping Hamas off the face of the earth. Um, I, I don't see how that, I mean, that's possible. Um, but you can't eradicate an idea. And, and Hamas is part of the wise Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Islamist movement. It, uh, it, there are many, many Hamas supporters outside Gaza, but Gaza certainly is being is being uh, flattened effectively and will continue to be so. Um, I would imagine that Hamas have been lying in wait, waiting for a large scale inv- Israeli invasion. Um, I'm certain they booby trapped everything. I'm certain they're waiting to ambush the Israeli troops, just as Hezbollah did in t- 2006. Um, when Israel rolled into southern Lebanon and found it the going much harder than it thought it would. Um, but the numbers that Israel will mobilize um, could be overwhelming on one level. On the other hand, they're going to run up against international law and war crimes law and the Geneva Conventions and expelling populations. And uh, it's a very, very difficult tangle of, of legal and military challenges that Netanyahu faces, never mind the political. And in what sense does he run up against uh, international law? In what sense is that a constraint? Uh, as you said, he's got all the motives you just described to show Israelis that he is he is uh, going to um, hit back at Hamas, try and wipe out their leadership. But Gaza being what it is, so densely built, lots of civilians will uh, are very likely to be in the line of fire, to be killed by this assault. Uh, at what point... If at all, does that, does that become a constraint on Israel? The International Criminal Court has already begun an investigation into uh, crimes against humanity within the Palestinian territories um, and has made it clear that its, it's, uh, its focus is on Israel and on Hamas. Um, uh, Israel is not as signed up to the International Criminal Court, but it is a signatory to the Fourth Geneva Convention. And the Fourth Geneva Convention prohibits transferring populations out of uh, out of an area um, it also prohibits large scale transferring your own population into it so he, so the the fourth geneva convention whether or not netanyahu chooses to abide by it ignore it or calculate that the world is so appalled that he might get a pass on this it is there and international jurists are watching Elham, can you take us into how other countries in the region are looking at this and how they might respond, including quietly behind the scenes. So the Arab League uh, concluded an emergency meeting in Cairo yesterday, um, and it released a statement, basically, which is very similar to the statement that's released uh, on past occasions uh, during periods of intense violence between the two sides. Um, it's called for de-escalation. It's called for the importance of resuming the peace process and restarting talks between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Um, Now, the Gulf states have taken an interesting position. Um, The two Gulf states that do have relations with Israel, the UAE and Bahrain, have issued very carefully worded statements which appear intended not to antagonize Israel. Um, They've called for general restraints, they've actually condemned Hamas, um, and they've left it at that without talking about the humanitarian consequences on Gaza. By comparison, the four other Gulf states that don't have relations with Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Oman, and Kuwait, have been much tougher in their statements. They've described the situation as resulting from the occupation and from the continued deprivation of the Palestinians from their rights. So when it comes to the Gulf states, um, we are seeing the split right down the middle between the countries that do have ties with Israel, um, who have been a bit more muted, and those that don't. That's not to say that there aren't conversations happening behind the scenes. I think it's likely that the UAE is sending some messages behind the scenes, but the public face of this looks very different. Really interesting point. Where is Turkey in all this? 
I think it's interesting to see, to look at Turkey, because on the one hand, there is some rapprochement between between Turkey and Israel and Netanyahu and Erdogan, met the, 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 the silence of, 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 the, of the UN General Assembly. But Erdogan already came yesterday with a very strong statement that they won't tolerate, Turkey won't tolerate the killing of, of, of innocent Palestinians or in, in Gaza. So I think Turkey is trying, on the one hand, to get closer to Israel and improve relations after 13 years of very tense relations since the Marmara fiasco, and at the same time to still be seen as the, as the champions of the Palestinians, especially of, of, of the Gazan case. How this is going to work together at the same time, while we see already the picture from Gaza, I have my doubt. I think at the end of the day, the language from, from Ankara will get more and more critical of Israel. Steve, your take. Erdogan has already come out um, and said he regards uh, Israel's response as disproportionate, um, in his words, uh, preventing people from meeting their most fundamental needs and, and bombing housing. So his rhetoric is strong and likely to get stronger. And just sticking with that picture of Gaza at the moment, Elham, can you take us into the uh, humanitarian implications for Gazans at the moment? Yeah, the, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is dire. So entire neighborhoods have been flattened, apartment blocks decimated. Um, Gaza's largest university has also been bombed. Multiple UN facilities have been damaged and major roads leading to the hospitals were also shelled. Um, what we're seeing is, in fact, the worst version of the 2021 devastation. That was just two years ago. Um, and the response is, 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 you know, Gaza is, a, is one of the most densely populated places on earth. Half of its population are children. It's 2.2 2. 2 million people cramped into a very tight space. Um, this time, Israel also cut off the electricity to the strip before bombardment. So there's currently no electricity there. Generators are running out and medical staff are saying that, you know, once this happens, you're going to have an even bigger crisis. Um, at the same time, the Rafah border with Egypt has also been been shelled. Um, that would have been the only pathway out. So there is no way out for these many, many civilians who are trapped in the space. Um, it's an absolute catastrophe. Steve, you've followed conditions in Gaza for a very long time. Can you take us a bit into what they are now? What people are saying in Gaza now is that they've never seen anything like this. Um, we're seeing uh, quotes from people whose houses have been destroyed, whose whole streets have been destroyed, um, saying they've lived through all the wars, but they've never witnessed anything worse than this. And, and it isn't over yet. Um, so I think uh, there's only one power station in Gaza and it's down. Food is going to be short. Uh, we've seen Gaza has had decades of woe and misery and, and may well be heading for its nadir. And that is really saying something in a place with 2.3 million people packed into, into, into a place they can't get out of. And of course, what many of them say is, whatever you think of Hamas, don't take this out on civilians. Don't take this out on us. It wasn't me who did this. Um, how much there is a, an ear willing to listen on the other side of the border, who knows at a time like this with so much pain and, and misery inflicted and there as well. Netanyahu at one point called on Gazans to leave to be safe. Um, but the border uh, with Egypt, the only plausible border for them to exit over, is indeed closed, as we've just heard. Uh, is that going to remain the case, do you think? Egypt has said it is certainly prepared to talk about getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. Um, but the last thing Egypt wants is a large flood of hundreds of thousands of uh, refugees, again refugees, um, coming into Egypt. Uh, I mean, just look at the region, look at the 1948, 700,000 Palestinians left uh, into Lebanon, into Syria, into Jordan. Um, Egypt will not want a repeat of that. And Sisi's language was uh, close to saying we're not about to take the responsibility for the, uh, for the upkeep of these people away from Israel. Palestinians need to stay where they are. Um, you know, in, in other words, we're not going to shoulder the problem. You can't send the, everybody through to us. We will talk about getting aid through to them. Uh, Sisi is very anti-Hamas. Um, Hamas is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Sisi came to power by toppling the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. He is not going to want a large Hamas pr presence in Egypt, complicating his own domestic situation. So very difficult humanitarian political calculations for Egypt. Let's turn finally to the question of where 
discussions, if I can use that word, between Israel and the Palestinians, where that question goes in the future. Yossi, you were talking earlier in um, what amounts to hope, I think, in this particular subject, that then all this might prompt um, a recognition that uh, this this um, unresolved question of the decades now needs to be addressed finally. Do you really think that's plausible, as Steve has also put to us? Uh, so many people in Israel uh, beyond anger saying, what is the point of talking to Hamas? Or, or, and and, and, and I, I guess by extension to Palestinians, I'm not saying that Hamas, obviously, is, is, is the same as the Palestinians. Probably Hamas excluded itself from any peace negotiations, for maybe forever, but definitely for a long time. Let, let's take that as solid ground then. Yeah, I think... <laughs> but on the wider question but of the Palestinians. It, 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 the important thing is to differentiate from millions of Palestinians, and let's not forget 5.7 million of them are refugees that UNRWA is in charge of. This is different. And what happens right now in Gaza, there are 2 million people, 1.2 of the million are refugees. They have nothing to do with Hamas. So again, the longer is, and this is about what foreign policy is all about. It's about resolving situation like this. And it's not whether I'm hopeful or not. Of course, those are such dark days, it's difficult to be hopeful. But this is exactly the time we need to plan for the day after the war. And good statesmen, good strategists, and we saw it in history, it's not that we invented. All, all wars ended in some sort of peace. And so we need to look for solution and change the course of history. But this takes leadership. It tends to change the discourse within society. And we already saw it be, you know, in 1993 with Oslo, before that Madrid. And, some, and even earlier, you know, after the 1973 war, came in 1977, Sadat came and visited, visited Israel and ended in, in peace agreement. So it's not that it's impossible. It takes leadership, it takes courage. And moving the discourse that courage is only in the battlefield, but actually one needs more courage in, in the peace field. Elham, where do you think this goes? It's, it's a really tough situation. I'm, I'm happy to hear Yossi's somewhat positive assessment. Um, I think we have to look at the failures of both the Trump and Biden administrations most recently, um, they've devoted very little diplomatic capital to resolving the real conflict at hand, which is between Israel and the Palestinians, and instead poured their diplomatic energy into the normalization process and expanding Israel's relations with the Arab states who are not in a state of conflict with it. Hopefully this is a reminder to the United States as well that this issue is not gonna go away. It should be a reminder to the Arab states too that this issue is not going to go away. And if we can be optimistic, maybe this can lead to greater momentum on the peace track, which never should have been sidelined in the first place. Steve, your view of this, and Elham has usefully mentioned the word Trump. The PLO and President Mahmoud Abbas have for years been making the argument that if you don't deal with us, the representatives of the Palestinian people on Jerusalem, on refugees, on borders, on land, you will empower the extremists who will say negotiations have got you nothing. The only way is the way of the gun and the bomb. That is precisely what has happened over the recent years. Abbas is marginalized. He has nothing to show his people for his pro-negotiations approach. Um, Israel hasn't um, engaged with him. And the likelihood that Israel is going to engage with anyone now for a while, I think is extremely unlikely. I mean, Hamas, is a terrorist organization, according to Israel, the United States, the European Union. Um, and I think it's going to be very hard for moderate Palestinians and moderate Israelis to make the case that we, if we don't deal with the moderates, we will end up with the people you're seeing doing this now. It's, it's, it's going to be a brutally, brutally hard time for diplomacy. On that note... We are going to have to draw to a close, hardly having brought this subject to an end. And of course, we will return to it. But at Chatham House, we pride ourselves on bringing discussion to some of the world's most difficult problems uh, at exactly the point when they seem not capable of resolution. So a big thank you to my guests, Yossi Meckelberg, Elham Fakro, Steve Farrell. Do follow them all on Twitter. The links are in the show notes. A reminder that you can find all of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or major platforms, as well as through our social media. So do like, follow, subscribe. Please do leave us a review. We do read them. I read them. 
and to read more from our experts or to find out more about our many events and we're convening some at very short notice on these kind of questions or to become a member and we'd really love to have you don't forget to visit chathamhouse.org and you can find all the work of all our programs there including the Middle East program so goodbye from me Bronwyn Maddox thank you for listening